It is a signal to me, apparently, to start. Mrs. Heinemann, ladies and gentlemen, we are met here this afternoon, as you know, to uh, dedicate the Danny Heinemann Library of the History of Physics. This library was given to the Institute of Physics to be incorporated in its addition to the building which we have just completed. It was Mr. Heinemann's wish to uh, name this library for his old friend and associate Niels Bohr, and uh, Mr. Bohr agreed to uh, have his name associated with the library. We had hoped that uh, Mr. Bohr would be here today, but because of uh, his health, he felt that he could not do so. He has, uh, he has sent us a message which I would like to read at this time. I am much moved to have my name associated with the Library for the History of Physics, the establishment of which has been made possible by the generosity of the late Danny Heinemann. Historical studies are an important tool for the understanding of man's position in the modern world, and in this century the history of science assumes particular significance. It is therefore gratifying to see so great an increase of creative scholarship in that field, and I hope that its furthering development will be greatly encouraged and facilitated by the opening of this library. The Institute of Physics, as, uh, as you have read, I believe, from the uh, little leaflet that was given you, is carrying on two different enterprises in the history of physics at this time, one under the direction of Dr. King, which you will see some of the results of in the library, and one under the auspices of a joint committee of the American Physical Society and the American Phys Philosophical Society on the history of theoretical physics in the 20th century. Professor John Wheeler is the chairman of that joint committee, and he has sent me a telegram, which I will also read at this time. I am unable to be present on this happy occasion. All honor to the Institute for its great service to the history of science. It dedicates a wonderful new library today with the name of Niels Bohr. At the same time, in Copenhagen under Thomas Kuhn and in closest association with Bohr, it operates an urgent project to record this history before it is too late. May honor and success attend both enterprises. Congratulations and best wishes. It's from John Wheeler. Our uh, program today, as you've seen, has three speakers. I'm sure none of them need introduction to this audience. Our first speaker is Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, a long-time associate of, of Dr. Bohr's, both before and during the war, who will speak to us first then. Heinemann, Dr. Sawyer, colleagues, <laughs> friends. We uh, meet uh, on an occasion of particular sweetness, the home and center of an enterprise or constellation of enterprises in which all of us have a deep hope and a deep interest. I don't suppose that any one of us could keep away from an occasion that is associated with the name of Bohr, <laughs> and I am also very happy to start by expressing again the gratitude of a whole community uh, for the bequest that you have made to the Institute. <laughs> We're all aware painfully and uh, proudly and bitterly of the immense growth in our own science and uh, the growth in which this institute is an active, conscientious, and I may say rather helpless agent. <laughs> and we are aware of the growth about us of related sciences in which the relations are 
often very hard for us to, to seize with clarity, as they are with much of contemporary mathematics, and in others where the relations are close, uh, but the job of translation, the traditions, uh, very disparate, uh, as in biophysics as it exists today. I think we don't see the future of this growth very clearly and would like to tell you one anecdote. I had a visit perhaps some ten months ago but from Fyodorov, who is I think the scientific secretary of the Soviet Academy. He was in, at the UN across the street and he asked to come to Princeton to see the Institute and we arranged a luncheon for him. I didn't know him. And he came very early, so that we found our conversation wandering, and uh, we commented on how rapidly things were going and how many people were involved. And I asked him how he saw the somewhat more remote future. I said, this is not just a five or ten year plan. What do you think things will be like 50 years from now? And without a moment's hesitation, he said, everybody will be a scientist. Well, this rattled around the room for a few minutes, and he realized it wasn't true. <laughs> so he said, no, there will be no work, really, but everyone will be engaged in creative work, uh, creative activity. That also didn't sound exactly right. So he smiled and said very broadly, of course, there will always be people who are interested in sport. <laughs> I can't do any better. <laughs> But my point is uh, today is that uh, we are not quite as aware uh, of a, a, a growth uh, that is associated with the growth of the sciences, um, but does not seem, seems only humanly related to it, not logically. And that is a very great intensification of the study of history in all its forms and all its branches. Uh, The European historiographical tradition is quite foreign to anything that exists in China. And of course, any historical tradition is completely missing in India. But I think before the century is out, we will have histories of China and histories of India. I think they will be done in the Western world as well as in the countries of whom the history is to be written. The history of art is a quite modern subject, really, as a detailed, specialized, objective study. And the history of science you know a lot about, but it is true that it is only today that, uh, although the papers have been available since last century, that a critical edition of Newton's Principia is finally in preparation. Uh, it is only today that the basic question of the transmission of ancient mathematical and astronomical methods uh, to India, to China, is beginning to be elucidated. And there has been a, an extraordinary vigor in the history of law, the history of the arts and sciences, as well as in political history, which parallels the vigor of the sciences themselves. I would myself say that these studies need no other justification and rest on no other justification than the main one that we always give when we are asked why a man should do <laughs> physics or biology. It is simply the interest in knowing how things are, rerum cognoscere causa. And I don't believe that any uh, preconceptions about the practical value of the history of science um, should blur the basic and central value that it is nice to know what men thought, how they were led to think it, how men <coughs> acted, how they conceived of their actions, and to know it as near the truth as possible. The canons of truth in history are not identical with those in science. Uh, but there is a, a tradition, a historiographical tradition, almost as 
helpful in the study of history as is ours in the study of physics. There are, though, a number of reasons, all of them it seems to me good, uh, why the history of science has collateral hopes and virtues, and why the history of modern physics in particular uh, is something that offers a particularly rich field and a rich hope. <laughs> I would mention just two of the, the practical reasons. I'm not sure that I, I share the high hopes, but I certainly recognize that they are addressed to problems of extraordinary difficulty and gravity. One of the ways in which one might hope to round the education of young people is to teach them, in addition to something of the substance of some science, easy to say, hard to do, some elements, some valid elements in the history of the subject. And we all know that a very great impediment to the teaching of the history of science is that in no real sense is it known. It is a subject which has to be learned before it can be taught. Uh, this alone would be a practical ground for a vastly increased effort. There is history of science. Every text begins with uh, Thales or Archimedes, but it is a ritualized and often in very inaccurate and thoroughly unilluminating account of what really went on in the world. It's not so easy to find out. I am very much for the serious enrichment of the literature and the sources in the history of science. And I think that if the beauty of the subject were not enough, the educational value as a supplement to some learning of science itself would be persuasive too. I have to say that I think the history of science is not an easy way to learn science. It's perhaps the hardest way. The way Newton found his great discoveries is very much harder than the way that we would like to teach them. And I believe that even the quantum theory, which many of us have lived through a little bit, was found in a very difficult way indeed, that we can do it much easier today. Uh, but, and I don't believe that one should, should falsify history and write it as though it were being done for a pedagog, as though it had happened for pedagogical purposes. But I think that uh, taken as a story of human achievement and human blindness, the discoveries in the sciences are among the great epics, and they should be available in our tradition. I also think that no account of the history of a subject is a substitute for some first-hand quasi-athletic experience in doing it, and uh, I would hesitate to see um, the history of science recommended as an educational cure-all. The other, another rather closely connected function of these studies is, and where the contemporary scene is perhaps of particular interest and hope, uh, is to make some connection between the great changes in the world, so largely catalyzed either by the applications of science or based upon some resonant features of the discoveries of science, to make some connection between these and the human tradition, the human traditions of which we are all the inheritors, uh, to bring some coherence to
into the general intellectual and cultural life of our time. I here again think that the wider dissemination, which must inevitably wait on the wider exploration of stories in the discovery of nature, uh, is one but only one way uh, to bring about that better recognition of the elements of unity in human life, the absence of which is so painfully clear today and often so vulgarly <coughs> misdescribed. I think that also in this problem, which I suppose in the jargon would be called adult education, but which I think we will come to think of as the continuing study of our pup, of, of people in days when affluence and leisure make it possible, that this is only one, if a very hopeful and important component. But let me address myself to the undertakings of which this new library will be the home, to just such things as Dr. Sawyer summarized, an attempt to capture with all due caution as to the fallibility of memory the recollections of the great actors in recent physics, the wonderful sources of letters, of first drafts of papers, of lecture notes, um, all, the, all the things which time erodes and which give to the past that uh, luminous but often misleading quality of simplicity, and which we now have an opportunity to make available to scholars in their richness so that it will be possible to discover of this time not only what we all know, that it was a heroic time, but that it had its, uh, its share of crooks and robbers and fools as well as its great and noble men. <laughs> and indeed, that hardly anyone has not at some time uh, d done and written things which he later had good reason to wish to disown, not as pa Pauli's father did by adopting a new name, but in some more modest way. <laughs> <laughs> the, the times we have lived through are, I believe, truly heroic times. Uh, they are certainly times of great change, and just as intellectual history, the achievements in physics in this century seem to me to stand with the high points in the whole history of human knowledge, in the quality of, of the insight and the beauty of the work that was done. I think we cannot imagine a century in which Einstein and Bohr lived and did their great work, except as a very special time in the human story. I don't want to limit this to two men. I don't want to limit it to physics. But we are here really to talk about an enterprise <coughs> in which these two men will hardly be absent. It is also a time a very great change. Um, Thirty-five years ago, your three speakers were all in Europe. <laughs> uh, Courant was examining me with, I hope, an atypical to tolerance uh, in mathematics at Göttingen. And Uhlenbeck was taking one of those leisurely and gentlemanly doctorates at the University of Leiden, which marked not the beginning but the crowning of a career. <laughs> And I was over there making only rather poor use of unparalleled opportunities for learning, which did not exist at all in this country, in my field, and at that time. Today, it is very different. Uh, we are so engulfed by the changes, the massiveness, the 
ferocity, the brashness, the virtuosity, the confusion of the current scene in physics, that we don't understand it very well. And it may not be possible for under us to understand it. The enterprise, enterprises which are now underway, for which this room will serve as hearth, should make it possible, if there are serious students of the human predicament in the future, to know very much more about what has befallen us than we who are acting and living in it. And they will see good and bad things both, and they will see them uh, in a wiser and deeper perspective than we who act in it. This heroic story, I think, is among one of the records that will really be studied and read. And perhaps not least for something which is not part of the history of physics, but will intrude into this collection, these collections and these reminiscences. And that is the historically hardly paralleled dedication and responsibility of physicists to the great, dark, tangled, ununderstood cause of a peaceful world. Thank you, Oppenheimer. Uh, today, as you notice, we are dedicating the Library of the History of Physics, named for Neil Bohr and uh, presented by Danny Heinemann. We have begun with the history of physics, and we shall now proceed to hear something about Niels Bohr. Uh, I should add a personal reminiscence. 35 years ago, when you were in Göttingen, and I was in Berlin, George Uhlenbeck was making his, having his first acquaintance, I think, with Niels Bohr. And this acquaintance close co cooperation has continued for 35 years. No one, I think, is better qualified than Professor Uhlenbeck, who came from Europe at that time to be professor of physics at Michigan and is now the Rockefeller Institute. No one is better qualified to t speak about the work of Niels Bohr. Mrs. Heinemann, sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, it is really a pleasure to uh, be asked to say a few words about Niels Bohr at this special occasion. And perhaps I should begin to apologize a little bit about the title. Uh, of course, I cannot make a portrait of Bohr, portrait of Bohr. And also, I think. One should not call Bohr just a physicist. There are too many of them nowadays. Uh, he is, in a certain sense, the patron saint of all the physicists. And that was came, became very clear to me when I tried to think what I should say at this occasion. And then I was irresistibly reminded of a song which uh, was composed uh, in my student days for the special yearly meeting of our student science society, named after Huygens. And this song was composed on the tune of the national anthem, Dutch national anthem. And the last verses were all the time, and Bohr and Einstein I've always revered. <laughs> It is therefore uh, uh, perhaps uh, a good point here to see what is it that has produced this feeling about Bohr and all of us. It is of course unnecessary to say that Bohr was really the founding father of the modern theory of atomic and molecular structure. His first papers in which he applied the ideas of the quantum theory of Planck and Einstein to the Rutherford model of the atom, and which culminated in this miraculous derivation of the Balmer formula, 
will, I think, remain, is and will always remain one of the glories of the human mind. And this was only the first of his many contributions. Then also, although I don't think either that that is the real reason, he was, uh, and this is also very well known, the man who inspired and guided and deeply influenced a whole generation of physicists who together with him in the 20s made this quantum revolution to which Robert alluded, which changed the face of the world. At that time, of course, Copenhagen, and in Copenhagen, the Institute of Theoretic Physique of War, was the place where all of us went for shorter or longer periods, and anyone who at those times attended one of these conferences, which were more or less regularly held every year there, and which I have also the privilege to attend several times, will never forget those uh, kind of conference, which is for me not always still the ideal conference. The way Bohr there, so to say, led the discussion. I don't know whether one could say led it. He always interfered, all right. And, uh, always questioned the speaker, and it is so well known the way he started always his questions. This was not to criticize, but only to learn. But then he started to criticize. <laughs> <laughs> and it is really, this was one of the things which we always remember, even at, at that time, and also now, well, it is often difficult to follow him and to appreciate the qualms that he has and, uh, or better to say, to appreciate this great struggle for understanding. And I think at this point uh, we come to the real reason for our veneration. It is this deep seriousness which was completely disinterested and which always was always directed to find out the really fundamental and general principle. In this respect, Bohr is a natural philosopher in the old sense of the word. He always tried, and he still tries, to probe all human experience deeper and deeper. Nur in der Tiefe wohnt die Wahrheit, as Schiller said. And <coughs> and he never, which is also I think typical of the way he uh, talks, is he was never of course a professional philosopher, nor was he purely speculative in the way which, uh, to which the physicists so often object in any philosophical discussion. He always started with some concrete questions and he always returned to it, because in some way the philosophy had to work. It had really to illuminate the basic simplicity or com complexity of the phenomena. I think anyone who has talked at length with him, or who has heard him speak, must be, I think, impressed by this continuous struggle in Boer to reach understanding. I say continuous because he never gives up and is really indefatigable. I realized this recently, again, when a Boer came to the Rockefeller Institute where, uh, to accept an honorary degree, he did this with a humility which touched us all. But then he also wanted to make use of the occasion to find out more about the recent developments in biophysics and especially 
about this question about the duplication of DNA and the mechanism of cell multiplication, etc. And there are, of course, experts at the Institute about that. He wanted especially to know, and he came back to it all the time, whether this proposed explanation of the unwinding of the double spiral of the DNA molecule is now really understandable on the basis of the physical law. He came back and back to it and wanted to find out, is it honest thermodynamics, he said. And if it is honest thermodynamics, why is it then that sometimes the duplication goes on, like when a bacteriophage phage enters a cell, and sometimes it stops? Again, he asked all the biophysicists, why does it stop? And of course they didn't know. Uh, but he wanted, came always back to it, and through many special questions, which he wanted to know also still in detail, he always came back to these fundamental questions, why does it stop? I must say, it was very inspiring, but it was also extremely exhausting. <laughs> I mean, after a day and a half, this group of young biophysicists at the Institute and I simply could not look out of our eyes anymore. But Boer was still going strong. Let us hope that he will still be able to continue his struggle for understanding for many years. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm back to speak about uh, Mr. Heinemann, we are fortunate to have uh, Professor Koran. Uh, as uh, Mr. Oppenheim has, has said, 35 years ago, Professor Koran was uh, director of the Mathematics Institute of Göttingen. Later, he was head of the uh, physics department at New York University and is now emeritus professor at New York University. He has been a long-time close friend, both of Dr. Bohr and Danny Heinemann. He will speak to us about Mr. Heinemann. Mr. Sawyer, the Heinemann family, ladies and gentlemen, to the officers of the American Institute of Physics and to the other colleagues and guests in particular, as members of the Heinemann family, I want to express personally the greetings from Niels Bohr, with whom I spent yest yesterday just the hours before my departure for New York. Bohr shares fully the appreciation and admiration of many of us for the donor of this library, Danny Heinemann. Presumably, not many of you have known this extraordinary man whose roots in life may seem remote from the world of science. It is therefore a genuine privilege for me to talk about the Danny, as all his friends and acquaintances called him affectionately. He was born almost 90 years ago in South Carolina. His mother, who must have been a woman of quite unusual strength and wisdom, sent the son to study at the Technical University of Hanover and at the University of Bonn. Among his teachers, men such as Karl Runge, Kaiser, Parschen, and Heinrich Hertz greatly appealed to the talented students of electrical engineering and science. But his interests were very much broader than those of an ordinary science student. From his young years on, he acquired a profound knowledge of literature and poetry, English, French, and German alike. I have never met anybody with a similar lively mastery and memory for all the great classical works of world literature. They indeed became a part of him, and his exquisite style of writing and speaking in all these languages seemed to be a reflection 
of his unique literary background. At the same time, he was a deep connoisseur of classical music with a particular love for Mozart and Schubert. However, much as he was attracted by the world of meditation and contemplation in the arts and sciences, his deepest human motivation was that of a man of action. He simply had to be involved in the great world and had to do, to do something constructive there. From his young years on, he, pursue, he felt that he pursued what he felt was his great mission in this world, namely to create wars, to create vast resources of power, mostly hydroelectric power at that, as a basis of an improvement of living conditions of humanity. The challenge of such a worldwide task animated him ever since his staff as a freshman engineer. To transform his great dream into reality indeed required all the resources of a dedicated penetrating intelligence of broad knowledge and human wisdom. It required the skill of a consummate technician, the genius of an organization and in high finance. The highest qualities of a statesman and leader of human beings on all levels from laborer to king. I cannot describe the scope of his success on a worldwide basis. Enough to say that his life work brought and kept him in close contact with a wide range of outstanding personalities, scientists, bankers, industrialists, heads of states. He was indeed a statesman within the framework of international business. Also, as a humanitarian, in particular in post-war relief, he made most significant contributions which I cannot describe here. At this present occasion, we are mainly concerned with Danny Heinemann as a humanist, as a friend of the arts of, and sciences. He has done much in support of music and musical talent. Also, on the basis of his exquisite collection of rare books and manuscripts, he has supported libraries as well as musicological and other research. Most seriously, however, he was interested in science and scientific work. When, at an age, at an age well over 80 years, he retired completely from business activities, he made a serious effort to learn and to refresh in technical detail what he knew already, more or less precisely, about recent developments in physics and in electronics. He attended university courses and obtained private instruction and was completely tireless in trying to, uh, to collect the information that during his most active years he just had to, uh, to Go. Most of you are aware of the, Danny Man, uh, of the Danny Heinemann Foundation, whose funds, among other objectives, were used to establish the Heinemann Prizes in Mathematics and in Physics. <coughs> Friendly personal relations with scientists gave Danny a great deal of satisfaction. Among his scientific friends, Niels Bohr was certainly the most outstanding. I also can see that Niels Bohr had a great appreciation and liking for Danny Heinemann and was impressed by his broad and charming personality. It was therefore a highly appropriate idea of Danny to express his feelings towards Niels Bohr by donating to the American Institute of Physics funds for the Niels Bohr Library, which is being dedicated today and which is intended specifically for this to help the study of the tortuous ways in which the development of modern physics in the last 60 years as a human activity has proceeded, always greatly dominated by the towering personality of Niels Bohr. Thank you. And 
to Pastor Karan. Uh, I'd like to say that at the close of this ceremony that we shall visit the uh, Danny Heinemann Library, the Boyle Library, which Danny Heinemann has presented to the Institute and which is part of the new building, which is now, and the library is now complete and open, and it contains some of the collections of uh, Dr. King's on the history of physics. Also in the corridors around the library are photographs which have been collected of the past offices of the societies which are associated with the Institute. We are fortunate to have with us here today uh, not only Mrs. Heinemann, but uh, Mr. Heinemann's son and daughter. At this time, I will uh, I'd like to receive from Mrs. Heinemann the key to the library, then I will uh, conduct her to the library, and I hope the rest of you will follow us there. I wish I could express an adequate word the real happiness, how really happy my husband was to be associated with the advancement of science. It is for me proud said to present to you in his stead the key which will open wide the door to the nearest library. Thank you very much. We shall now go to the library.